Today on Know the Truth, a message from Philip DeCourcy. Given the primacy of preaching in Jesus' ministry, I want to remind you and I of the primacy of preaching. It's why he came, and he has sent us out, according to John 17, out into the world as the Father had sent him. If the Father sent him to proclaim, has Jesus not sent us to proclaim? It was at the heart of his ministry. It must be at the core of our commitment. probably heard the sarcastic reply, practice what you preach. But today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy calls us to practice what Jesus preached. We're learning from the ultimate teacher who preached God's Word and lived it out as an example to us all. It's the beginning of an exciting message titled, The Primacy of Preaching, where we follow the footsteps of Jesus in the action-packed Gospel of Mark. So let's join Philip now as he takes us to Galilee, where we find our Savior at work. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, that the world is full of books about the Lord Jesus. Of that, there is no doubt. In fact, if you think about the Bible itself, if you think about the Word of God itself, at its heart, it's a book about Jesus. We see that, don't we, in Luke 24, as Jesus begins with Moses and then goes on into the prophets and shows to his disciples the things concerning himself. The coming of the Lord Jesus, his death and burial on our behalf, it's a red thread that weaves its way through all of the Bible. The world is full of books about Jesus. The Bible is a book about Jesus. Therefore, how ironic that Jesus didn't write any books. He didn't write any books. That's one of the striking features of Jesus' life and legacy. He did not leave us a single written sentence. Instead of writing on the skins of dead animals, Jesus chose to write upon the hearts of the living through the preaching of God's Word. I want to remind you that Jesus was a preacher, not an author. That Jesus believed in preaching. Jesus believed in biblical exposition. He believed in its transforming power, and he believed in its redemptive reach. Jesus was the first of Christianity's preachers. He was both its message and its messenger. In fact, if you and I were to look at Mark's gospel alone, those who have studied it critically tell us that almost 40% of the verses of Jesus in this gospel contain teaching from him. If you look at the gospels as a whole, 90 times Jesus is addressed directly. And on 60 occasions, he's called teacher. That's how he was known. That's how he was seen. In fact, that's how he understood himself. You remember that Nicodemus comes to him at night in John 3, verse 2? We know that you are a teacher who has come from God. Jesus himself, speaking of himself, said, you call me teacher in John 13, 13. And Lord, and rightly so, for so I am. The Lord Jesus is a preacher. The Lord Jesus is a teacher. In fact, the reality of that is underscored in the verses we're coming to look at. Look at verses 14 and 15 in Mark chapter 1. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. We see here that Jesus begins his ministry preaching. He came preaching. And the intent of the grammar there is that he didn't come preaching and stop doing that at some point. He came preaching and continued to preach the kingdom of God and that people must repent and believe. In fact, if you go a little bit further into the story of Jesus here in Mark chapter 1, I want you to notice that we are introduced to a day in the life of the Lord Jesus. 
And in verse 32, we read about the coming to the close of that day. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. I want you to notice this. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him, that's his disciples, searched for him. And when they found him, they said, everyone's looking for you. Let's pause here. You know, there's a line out the door, Jesus. Everybody knows about what you did last night. They want a repeat performance. They want another miracle crusade. They want you to heal the sick. They want you to deliver the demon possessed. That's what's going on here. I want you to notice Jesus' reply. Very, very important that you and I notice this. But he said to them, that's to Peter and those who had found him, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. I just think that's a verse we have overlooked and underappreciated. Jesus saw his preaching to be at the heart of his ministry and why he came. In fact, Jesus was concerned here that his healing ministry and that his exorcism was beginning to eclipse the primary focus of his ministry. Yes, he healed. Yes, he delivered, but he preached, and that's why he came. And when those things got in the way, when the secondary began to eclipse the primary, Jesus said, okay, boys, let's go on to the next town because I want to preach there, and that's why I came. The primacy of preaching is underscored here in the life of the Lord Jesus in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, and in Mark chapter 1, verse 38. In fact, let me reinforce this from another angle. Let's go to another synoptic gospel. Let's get another angle on this time and season in Jesus' life. Go over with me to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Let's break in at verse 14. The temptation of Jesus has just ended. And here's what we read. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And the news of him went out through all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, to recover sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant and sat. And all the eyes of those who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I'm the one spoken of by Isaiah. But here's the point. I want us to notice, as Jesus begins his ministry, okay, in the power of the Spirit in Galilee, that's what Mark's talking about back in chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. I want you to notice, here's what Jesus said about his ministry. He has come to preach the gospel. He has come to proclaim liberty to the captive. He has come to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What's my point? I hope you've got it by now. We see in Jesus' ministry the primacy of preaching. Now, given that priority, given the primacy of preaching in Jesus' ministry, I want to remind you and I that we need to give our ears and our attention to what we're about to learn from the Lord himself because preaching is passe in many churches today. Pastors don't see the exposition of God's word as their primary calling. They don't spend their week in the study. Pulpits are being moved to the side and stools and other things are replacing the centrality of the Word of God. People can't stand 45 minutes of exposition. Give me 20, make it peppy, make it interesting and appealing. Don't give me a lot of theology or doctrine. This is what's happening in churches 
And I want to remind you that the Lord Jesus, as the founder of Christianity, would remind us of the primacy of preaching. It's why he came. It's what he did. And he has sent us out, according to John 17, out into the world as the Father had sent him. If the Father sent him to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, has Jesus not sent us to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord? Christianity rises or falls on the proclamation of the gospel. It was at the heart of his ministry. It must be at the core of our commitment. Listen, first and foremost, Christianity is a message. First and foremost, Christianity is a message. It's the message of the gospel. And it must be preached. It must be proclaimed. We must use every way and means of proclaiming it and preaching it. In fact, we see this in the book of Acts. What's the book of Acts? It's a record of the expansion of the early church. Here we see what the church was all about. What did those early Christians do? Here we are, two millennium beyond them. As we look back, what are they up to in the first years of the church? They're up to preaching the word. And that's the cause of Christianity's expansion. In the book of Acts, we see in one generation, the church go from a small band of people meeting in an upper room in Jerusalem to a worldwide phenomenon that has reached the epicenter of Rome itself. Because the book ends with Paul under house arrest, but he's unhindered and he's preaching the kingdom and teaching the kingdom of God. That which began in an upper room has gone into the four corners of the empire where we read in the book of Acts, this thing's no longer done in a corner. Christianity's making the headlines. It's the first story on the evening news. They're either causing riots or revivals. That's what's happening in the book of Acts. And we see this implicit message from Luke that preaching was the engine that drove church growth and missionary endeavor. Why do I say that? Because one of the things that is interesting about the book of Acts is that Luke gives us summary statements with kind of every expansion, as the rippling influence of the church expands further and further from Jerusalem to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth, Luke kind of gives us summary statements. Let me give you some of them. In Acts 6 and verse 7, here's what we read. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. What's the cause of this growth? The word of God spread. It was being preached. It was being taught. Go over to chapter 12 and verse 24, and we'll read something similar to that. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Go over to chapter 13 and verse 49. Again, Luke tells us that preaching was the engine that drove the growth of the church. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. One more. Right at the end, I made reference to it. Acts 28 and verse 31, Paul's under house arrest. This is his first imprisonment. And we read, Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Interesting footnote here. I'm not a Greek grammarian, but I'm told that the book of Acts ends with an adverb. The book of Acts ends with, unhindered, no one forbidding him. What a wonderful note to finish with. The word of God is spreading like a prairie fire. The gospel is going across the Roman Empire. Listen, in a day when preaching is passé, we need to remind ourselves that in the 2,000-year history of the church, it was emphasized that there was this critical need to hear and heed the word of God. They understood that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, verse 17. And Paul answers the question, how shall they hear? They need a preacher. And beautiful are the feet of those who come preaching that good news. In fact, when you read of the histories of every church that was started and founded in the New Testament, again, you'll see that the Word of God creates the church. 
The church doesn't create the word of God. That's Catholic theology. The word creates the church. That's Protestant theology. And if you go to the book of Ephesians in chapter one and verse 12, what do we read? We who first trusted in Christ shall be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The word of God was taught, they believed it, and a little band of believers was founded in the city of Ephesus. Again, we see it in the city of Thessalonica. As Paul looks back and gives thanks to God for what the word of God did, and what God did, we read in verse five of chapter one of 1 Thessalonians, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit in which in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. Have I beat that nail home yet? The primacy of preaching? Jesus came preaching. And then he sends his apostles out into the world and they went preaching. And according to Dr. Luke, Preaching and teaching the Word of God was the engine that drove the growth of the early church. Every time Paul gives us a summary or a history of how the church was founded in a city, it's always about receiving the truth or receiving the Word. Listen, with its preaching, Christianity rises or falls. The preaching of God's Word will determine the future of our church, the health of our body the blessing and the eternal impact we'll have on our community. Listen to these words by Sinclair Ferguson, a Scottish theologian, Presbyterian thinker. Here's what he says. We live in days when in every quarter of the English-speaking professing church, there is a dearth of great preaching. And far more serious and widespread in its consequences, there is also a dearth of good preaching. The church can survive without great preaching. There have been times of revival without great preaching, but without good preaching, there can be neither survival nor revival. He's right. So let's look at this text. I want to let you into a bit of a secret. Go to your Bible, look at verse 13, and then look at verse 14. And though you can't see it, but in the space between 13 and 14, there's a whole year. There's a missing year in Mark's record. Now John gives us the record of that missing year because Jesus' early ministry after his baptism and his temptation was focused on Judea. You can read about that in John 1 verse 19 through to John 4 verse 45. But when we come to verse 14 of Mark's gospel, Jesus moves his base of operation from Judea to Galilee now, after John was put in prison, Mark 1, 14, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Galilee was a northernmost region of Israel. It was heavily populated. We can read about Jesus' ministry there in Mark 1, verse 14, through to Mark 8, verse 30. And it becomes good hunting ground, good fishing ground for the Lord Jesus. He has a good ministry in Galilee Things were much tougher in Judea and Jerusalem. There was unrelenting faithlessness in Jerusalem. You had the religious establishment there whose traditions made void the word of God. And Jesus would always be bumping up against these people. And there was a hardness around Jerusalem. There was a softness in Galilee. And the people heard him gladly there. And so Jesus moves his base of operations up into that northernmost region. Why? We might conjecture that it was triggered by John's arrest. Look at verse 14, Mark 1. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee. Jesus also might have been arrested if he had stayed where he was. And so in desiring to continue his work, he transferred his focus further north to where he grew up as a boy. And he would be there for some time and then he would move back towards Judea and towards Jerusalem in the final week of his life, recorded from about the middle of Mark 13 and forward. Galilee becomes a haven and a harvest for Jesus. That's kind of where we're at in the story. 
So let's look now at Jesus preaching. And there are several things I want us to see by the time we're finished. Jesus' preaching was experiential. Jesus' preaching was not divorced from his life. It wasn't something he did. It was as much something he was as something he did. We must never forget, according to John 14, verse 6, that Jesus himself was the truth. Jesus was the embodiment of truth. Jesus was 100% of what he taught. Jesus' preaching was never vague, it was never weak, it was never abstract, because his obedience was concrete. The Word of God was not something that he simply preached, it was something that he practiced, loved, obeyed, and lived. In fact, let me show you this. Let's back up in the verses we have already covered. Because in verses 1 through 9, we see that the Lord Jesus waited to emerge after the ministry of John the Baptist. And the ministry of John the Baptist was a fulfillment of Scripture. Look at how this gospel begins. Verse 2, as it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before your face. This is God talking to the Messiah, the Son in whom he would delight. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And John the Baptist appears in fulfillment of that prophecy. And then we read in verse 9, and it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John. Before he came preaching, he came at the moment the word of God was fulfilled. What's the point? The point is that standing behind the public preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ is a life that's being lived in absolute accordance with the Word of God. Jesus won't take a step unless it's a path that's being lit by the Word of God. The Word of God is what? A light onto our path and a lamp onto our feet. And as John appears in fulfillment of an ancient prophecy, Jesus realizes green light and he leaves Nazareth of Galilee and comes and be baptized by John. Jesus' preaching was experiential. Jesus had a love for the Word of God. He obeyed it, and He lived it. That is a challenging word from Philip DeCourcy here on Know the Truth. Today's message is called The Primacy of Preaching, and it's just one part of our current series titled Essential Jesus, Ready, Set, Go. Know the Truth is a Bible teaching ministry that delivers God's Word right to your car, your home, or wherever you are. We make it easy for you to study the Bible with no barrier of cost. But it does cost us to create and produce and distribute this program on radio stations and the web. So we invite you to give a generous donation to support Know the Truth today. Give when you call us at 888-644-8811. Or you can donate online at ktt.org. And to show our appreciation, we'll send you Philip's new book titled, You Go Girl. Examining the scriptures, Philip explores God's purpose for creating women, the prominence of women in the Bible, and the participation of women in today's churches. Be inspired to be used by God to encourage the women in your life. Ask for your copy of You Go Girl when you give today at ktt.org or by calling 888-644-8811. And when you give, we'll also send you the Love Is poster by Visual Theology. This frameable subway-style print displays a great reminder of how we can image the character of God to our family and friends and neighbors. Display it in your home or office or give it as a gift. And finally, if you don't yet follow us on social media, we'd love to connect. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for Philip DeCourcy or you'll find links at ktt.org. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd. So glad you joined us today. And be sure to come back for more bold biblical teaching from Philip DeCourcy next time on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. 